QSO Today, Episode 184, Thomas Hood, NW7US. QSO Today is listener-sponsored by you. Options for being a QSO Today supporter on menu items at the top of the QSO Today homepage. Please become a listener-sponsor today. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Uth 4 z one ug your host. Thomas Hood, NW7US, is the propagation editor for a number of shortwave and amateur radio magazines and has a wide variety of websites that grew out of his love for listening on the bands to far-off DX and commercial broadcast stations. Thomas shares his understanding of propagation and the lessons we can learn from listening, really listening, to the QSOs and exchanges during contest operation. NW7US, this is Eric Forza at 1UG. Are you there, Thomas? Yes, I am. This is NW7US, Thomas, in Nebraska. Thomas, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? I was a young boy living in Montana, and my parents gave us more or less free reign when we're not in school. And being a very curious boy, I would go through the house looking for things of interesting um, playability things that I could invent imaginative scenarios. So I would rummage through my dad's belongings and discovered cameras in a radio. And I secreted the radio away down a few houses from where we lived, went underneath the porch and began trying to figure out what this radio did. And I figured out how to turn it on and I began turning knobs, extending the antenna, and I heard all sorts of exotic noises coming out of this thing. And then I discovered AM broadcasting, FM radio stations. Those were kind of interesting. But man, the exotic sounds that came out of this one segment of the radio, when I switched this knob to something called SW, I was fascinated. There were weird sounds coming out of this thing. And then I came across this monotone clicking. And all of a sudden I heard, this is WWV, Fort Collins, Colorado. And gave the time. Why would anybody tell me the time on a radio and click out the seconds? It was obvious that these clicks were seconds being ticked away. So I would just sit there and listen and listen and listen, you know, kind of going off into dreamland a little bit. And then somebody came on and said how many sunspots there were and that we had a geomagnetic storm, which I had no clue what any of that meant. But sunspots? What were sunspots? And that was the spark for a lifelong curiosity about our sun and about whatever it was that these people were talking about on this little radio underneath the porch in Montana. And as I continued to experiment day after day during the summer, I heard things. This is Radio South Africa. This is the BBC. This is the Voice of America. Radio Australia. Deutsche Welle. I was like, wow, people talking from all over the world. How could that work? I mean, did you have to come out from under the porch at some point and, and confront your father that you'd found a radio? No, I never told them for quite a while. Matter of fact, <laughs> it wasn't until a couple of years ago when I posted a picture on Facebook because I found a radio at – over the years, the one that I had as a child disappeared somewhere, who knows where. Um but when I was at this ham fest, I came across the same exact radio. It's basically a Sony four-band portable radio, horrible receiver. But at the time, I didn't have any clue as to what was good or bad. It was just what it was. I posted that on Facebook, and my dad, who's also on Facebook, saw that. and goes, hey, that's the radio I bought when I was in Germany all the time in my car because it was able to be mounted in, in a vehicle. And I said, yeah, that was the first radio that I – ever used, and it got me started with what I'm doing outside of the computer side of things. It's what I do with my life. And he goes, yeah, I always wondered what happened to that. It disappeared. <laughs> well, it's because I stole it. <laughs> so, so after, you know, so many years, I was in the 1970s, early 70s, that I secreted that radio away. And speaking of that, like I told you, I was always curious. I would take a lot of my dad's belongings even alarm clocks, and I would disassemble them and then try to put them back together again because I wanted to figure out how they worked, and then I put them back together. Usually, I could put the thing back together, and it'll all be fine and worked. But alarm clocks, once in a while, I had extra little things laying around, and then they didn't have an alarm clock that worked, 
We go out and get another one. I would take that apart. I got in trouble a lot because of that. In Missoula, we lived on a military base. It's called Fort Missoula. 70s, there was a Navy reserve unit that had this long building that interior was redesigned as a ship, a model ship or a simulated ship. They had an engine room and, and all sorts of different parts of a ship. And, of course, that was fascinating to me as a young boy. So I would go in there and I would watch them do their drills and I would, you know, just observe mostly. But when they weren't there and drilling, I the building and I was looking at things like the telephone wires that came in and <laughs> I would double that. Of course, their phones never worked and they were trying to figure out why. It's because I was playing around with this stuff. And I got, like I said, in huge trouble. But my mind was so active and so curious about the scientific side of things, wires, and electricity. Yes, I was the boy that stuck things into an outlet and went boom with the electrical arc between, you know, two things. Got myself shocked, you know, assembling anything electronic and trying to put it back together. My dad caught on and to bring home these Radio Shack, like 150 in one project springs and you wire things together and they had the resistors and the transistors and a meter and a speaker, and a, you know, Morse code key that was just basically bent metal with a little plastic knob on it. He brought books home and fed my curiosity. And that was the start in radio. So how did you find your way into amateur radio? Well, I continued to beg information and my dad, I'm not exactly sure how he went about this, but he came across somebody. Now, I do remember we were at church, and I had a book on tubes listening to the sermon. I wasn't paying attention to the ethereal. I was in this book reading about tubes and how they worked. And I had a little sketch pad, and I was drawing a tube diagram, and I was just trying to copy and you know um, absorb all this information. And I guess there was somebody behind us in the pew behind me who was an amateur radio operator, but he didn't come directly to me. He took my dad aside privately. Your son will knack for electronics. I'm an amateur radio operator, and I'd like to give you information, some books and materials that you can give him to continue his. That was my first introduction to amateur radio indirectly through this connection. I'm not sure why the guy didn't you know, talk directly to me. Maybe my dad said no or something. I don't know. I have a clue. Um, but that was my first exposure. But then there was no amateur radio exposure for a very long time um, from, from the kid perspective. I think it was about four or five years later, we had moved from Montana down to Salt Lake City. My dad was restationed by the U.S. Army uh, to an installation in Salt Lake City. It was in Salt Lake City that I came across a neighbor because there was this huge tower, a big antenna. And I went, radio, I know what that is. So I went over there, and I boldly knocked on the door. And I said, you have a big antenna. Do you do radio? And that was where I first began to get Elmered directly on a radio. I actually got to send some Morse code. He gave me Amico records where I would go and listen to two words a minute, five words a minute. And I slowly began to learn Morse code the wrong way. I think now, but there was to me by my Elmer, my first Elmer. This I think was about seventy six or seventy seven. Do you remember? Do you remember what his name was or what his call sign? Tom Billis, maybe. Think about it, but I I have no clue what his call was. He's a silent key. Uh, I I think it was in the nineties that I discovered that he had passed away. So, what year did you get your first license, and how old were you? Well, there's the journey. See, I got Elmer, and I learned Morse code. But because I was a military brat, um, we started doing a lot more moving around. In Montana, I stayed there a good stint because my dad was able to convince the Army to let him stay there as long as possible because he just absolutely loved Montana. But then the military started moving us around. So after Salt Lake City, we moved back to Montana for a very short period, and then we moved up to Alaska. Um, this, this first Elmer of mine, though, did give me my second shortwave receiver and it, it was but it was made by collins and it's an interesting radio 
I'm trying to remember the nomenclature specifically. I'll have to go look at uh, where I can find that. But at the time, it, it was the most amazing radio. It dwarfed anything that portable radio could hear. Uh, so when we moved from Salt Lake, where I f- received that my first Elmer, you know, our short stint in Montana, then we went up to Alaska. Well, in Alaska, I erected a wire antenna around my bedroom along the walls with the darkness of winter almost all of the day and amounts of time just absorbing of shortwave from one end to the other and even AM DXing. And I heard stations from uh, during the nighttime with that makeshift antenna. So from Salt Lake up to Montana to Alaska and then Alaska back to Montana. High school, just graduating a real quick story. I went into my own business. I started, I was an entrepreneur. I went into satellite TV, sold satellite TVs, and I also did computer stuff. Because along the way, my dad became a computer salesman, brought home computers, and I started learning computers. So that was a natural thing for me to do is become this business person, started a business, had clients, did programming, and installed satellite TV. I got a partner, the partner embezzled, all of a sudden, I got sued. My lawyer said, because I'm like, or so, my lawyer said, you know the best thing for you right now? Let me handle exonerating you in court, but you should probably join the Army and just get the heck out of Montana. Because at that point, we had come back to Montana. And I said, join the Army to, with his life. I don't know if I want to do that. And well, I talked with my dad, and he convinced me, yeah, it's a good idea. You should do it. You can get this college fund and all that. Me. <laughs> So I joined the Army, and I went into the Signal Corps. I was a signal man, and I did shortwave stuff, and I did satellite stuff in the Army. So that childhood experience, radio, and learning about propagation, because I got books on propagation in the ionosphere, all of that lent itself to being a signal man in the Army. And amazing things while I was in the Army because of my knowledge. Child, When I got out of the Army... In Connecticut, and I worked at the Travelers as a programmer, and my supervisor was a ham radio operator. I had to relearn the code, and he helped me. So he was my second ham radio Elmer. He me along, and he and some other ham radio operator eventually gave me a novice test in the cafeteria. Morse code, and I had to receive Morse code to their satisfaction. And then I had a test, and I got my novice license. And that was 1990. And what was your call sign? KA1VGL. KA1, very good lasagna. Peters, people would say, hey, very good lasagna. And, that... and you upgraded uh, shortly after? Uh, not too long after that. Um, I stayed at the Travelers for about a year. <laughs> this is a negative, but my but I got custody of the kids. Had no interest in, at that time, being a mother. So... I ended up with kids, and I was working at the Travelers. They allowed me to telecommute for a bit, but it was just too difficult with, with basically an infant and a toddler to work all day and have you know two kids and being somewhat a new dad. My dad back in Montana, who had retired in Montana, and my mom there said, well, why don't you come back to Montana and we'll help you raise the kids? And I thought that was a pretty good prospect. So I gave my notice at the Travelers gear and other belongings and drove to Montana. When I got to Montana, it was a prime time for me to get a new call sign. And since it was a regulation that when you move into a new region, you had to refile anyway, uh, the FCC assigned me N7PMS. Horrible call sign for a guy, especially once I got to 80 meters. <laughs> Check in to these nightly round tables. I would, you know, give my call N7 PMS and man, it would be five to 10 minutes of ribbing, but I chose different phonetics than PMS. What people think of PMS Montana skunk. So that's what I pushed. Anytime people were ribbing me of PMS. Well, it does bring a smile to one's face when you first hear it. (laughs) Sure. But it irritated me at the time. So you're new in Montana. Did you get a rig at that point? I was still using the 520S, Kenwood 520S is my first rig. Uh, by the way, that was given to me by my second Elmer at the Travelers. 
uh, he he wanted to inspire me and get air. So he said, hey, I've got this old 520, Kenwood 5, TS520S. Uh, I'm going to give that to you as your first rig and as my gift that you passed your novice test and get on the air and operate. Let me build my first antenna, which was a random length of wire and a ground. Uh, and it was a Dentron tuner, which was about the size of two shoe boxes. Amazing Dentron you know, manual tuner. It tuned that random length of wire beautifully. Didn't that have a roller inductor inside? Yeah, yeah, it's a piece of machinery. Yeah, you don't see those. I don't think you see those very much anymore. A lot of think, uh, tuners have fixed uh, points on the coils. I think they don't make things the way they used to. Uh, there was some really great construction in some of those older uh, companies like Dentron. So, yeah, anyway, long story short, after Montana, I moved to Washington to find better opportunity for work. And that did help, you know, as, as a single dad. I was a single dad for 11 years, so I was raising those boys by myself. And ham radio still played a huge role for me. And I, through the years, upgraded until I got to Amateur Extra. And I had 520S. I went to a Kenwood 830, I think it was, an 830, which was a really nice band, which had to work. I mean, a radio. It had the work bands, uh, the WARC. I think work bands, uh, which like 30 meters and of those. So I got more spectrum and enjoyed, I, I began learning about 30 meters and, and what it was capable of. And I did a lot of ham radio stuff in uh, Washington. I was Washington, D.C. or Washington State? Washington State, um, the evergreen state. That's where I, when I upgraded to Amateur Extra, I applied for a vanity call for the NW7P, uh, NW7US to get a, away from that PMS call. And I chose NW7US because I am a huge fan of the Pacific Northwest and Montana. Montana is not considered the Pacific Northwest, but it's adjacent to it. So in my mind, anything Northwest United States is just beautiful. And so I wanted to promote that love by getting a call sign NW seven US and there were no NW seven prefixes taken by anybody. And even though I could have gone with a one by two call sign, I chose the two by two call sign because I wanted to promote the Northwest seven United States. I had this really excellent friend, Mitch N A seven US is a call sign that he applied for after he saw my call sign. He went, Hey, I like that idea. So he got North America seven US. Do you think that hams still enjoy shortwave listening? Can they do it? And do you think that it would make us better operators if we listened more? Oh, that's key. Great that you brought that up. I think there are a lot of people that don't listen well. I believe in my case that the extensive hours that I listened to shortwave and I listened to, you know, air traffic, I listened to mariners, I listened to military operations, and of course, I listened to a lot of ham radio, both Morse code and voice. And I gained a sense of more than just an etiquette, but a, a skill in communicating well the message that you're trying to convey. Well, when we're thinking here, I mean, it, it seems to me what I've heard from a number of operators, they say that if you spend enough time listening to a pileup, for example, in a in a contest, you start to figure out what the receiving station is doing. I mean, what, where the guy that's actually running the pileup, you, you kind of get a sense of where he's going to show up or where he's listening. And absolutely, uh, and in that that's sense, a lost skill, right? So I guess in in that sense, that was kind of the point of my question was is is that you know if we're listening more, then we kind of figure out what people are doing. Oh, I love the the hunt. I love the DXing hunt and pileups. Um, <laughs> I was a new ham, still living in Connecticut, and code, it's a little bit different than voice, but the same criteria of the hunt exists. You've got to listen carefully to find his modus operandi. What is that operator doing? How does he work that split? Does he go up? Does he go down? Uh, does he stay on a single frequency for a bit? What's his rhythm? And what's the rhythm of the pileup? Because I think a pileup begins to have its own rhythm. 
And if you can figure that out by listening for a while, and that's the trick too, because it may not be a long opening. So you got to get in there before the opening closes if conditions are marginal. But if you've got a good knack for listening to the rhythm of things, you'll find that opening. And man, I loved with 100 watts and a random piece of wire, I broke so many pileups. DX right out of the. Um, and I think that ability to break pileups, like the first or second call, I would be able to work the DX in really heavy pileups with 100 watts in a simple piece of wire. And again, I think the, the long time of listening to shortwave, the years before that, I just had the knack to hear that rhythm and find out where that opening was, where I could insert myself between the two beats, everybody calling and the guy moving just a little bit in frequency. So yes, the answer is absolutely learning how to listen to to grasp the rhythm of the pileup or whatever your environment's giving you out to success, in my opinion. It's not the huge antenna and the kilowatts and calling over and over and over and over and over and hoping that eventually something sticks to the wall. I mean, that's brute force, but I think the art and skill of DXing. As a longtime shortwave listener, do you think that the internet has replaced shortwave transmissions? I mean, is the shortwave band dead now, or um, is it the same as it always was? What, what, what do you listen for now? Yeah, that's a really great question. We are still in a phase. Governments feel that financially it's more effective, better use of their funds to now have streaming services that a voice in the world to express their culture, to express their outlook and their foreign policy. And so many radio stations have closed their radio outlets and moved that operation to streaming. A few of them discovered that it's not as effective as they thought back to shortwave, but on a limited basis. But a lot of stations that I grew up listening with are no longer on the air. Well, that gave me kind of a disillusionment, and I thought that the demise of radio. Very intuitive politicians that see that radio can still reach an audience that are not yet connected to the Internet, especially in developing countries or into areas of economic downturn. Or countries where the Internet is being blocked, for example. Exactly, exactly. So therein lies the joy of the DX hunt now for shortwave listener. There are stations that are not official and yet provide a voice for people who are bypassing their government to get their voice heard. So there are stations like that that can be hunted. Not all of them in English, unfortunately, but some of them are able to, to get you know somebody who knows how to speak English and you'll get a broken English transmission or whatever. Um, a lot of stuff coming out of Asia and a lot out of the Middle East, that's still an area of shortwave listening that I think is still alive. It's harder because you don't have these huge of level broadcasters. You'll have very weak stations because they don't have you know megawatts and ten arrays. They've got kilowatts or maybe just you know five hundred watts and a marginal antenna. So it's a bigger challenge. But I think the joy is there, the reward is there when you catch something extremely rare. The internet does provide some tools that aid that hunt, however. One, of course, is being several outlets of schedules that radio uh, broadcasters and listeners have put together databases of stations and frequencies and times that you can peruse to help figure out what you're hearing uh, or you know, target a time where you might want to catch a, a particular station. Uh, there's also things like what I provide, and that's the propagation and the science of uh, space weather and how conditions are, so that can be an aid to DXing as well. So shortwave is still vibrant, harder to get into, to find something of interest. You can't just tune across and hear an interesting type station anymore. Or Radio Nederland, where you have the program Smile Across the Miles, and you know these DX mailbags and whatnot. There's still some stations like from Cuba that do a DX mailbag, but it's not like the old wall to wall on a like the 31 meter band. You'd have so many stations. Now you have to hunt. Um, 
the brick houses now are like religious broadcasters for a fine, interesting. They're always there, so it's not a challenge. Your stations, uh, Kyrgyzstan or something, a thrill to hunt that. Of course, there's there's also the utility, military, aeronautical, marine. You know, there's a lot of other things on shortwave than just the broadcasters. Whole area that's still very vibrant as people want to listen to military and to aircraft because, you know, coast to coast, transoceanic flights still use shortwave key to their infrastructure. You just mentioned that um, that you have an interest in propagation, and I, I figure I'll, I'll give a, a chance for the listeners to hear some of your credits, that you're the propagation editor for CQ Communications Magazine, the Spectrum Monitor. I think that's where I first read you. Um, CQ VHF Magazine and Popular Communications Magazines. You also wrote about propagation in um, and other radio-related topics in um, uh, m monitoring times before its demise. And, and you mentioned that the, the interest in propagation started as a young child. H how did that interest in propagation continue to develop, and how did you end up being the um, the guy that writes about it? Yeah, and I'm also now Radio User UK magazine, and so I am now typically in the UK. Exciting. I, I'm into my... Well, February is my first month uh, publication in Radio U uh, Radio User UK. So back to that Sony portable radio and my first exposure to WWV and their solar bulletin, solar and terrestrial condition bulletin every hour. Um, when I discovered the sun and how it's a variable star and that things are always changing, it captivated my imagination for my whole life. When I learned about the ionosphere and the magic of a signal emanating from an antenna and refracted or bounced off of the sky, for me as a kid, gave me a chance to travel the world without leaving home. And that was all through that magic of the ionosphere. So it, it's captivated me for my entire life. And as I said, I got every book that I could possibly find on the topic. And there weren't many, but I would try to absorb whatever I could. Amateurs after the Connecticut, so I was part of a ham radio club there uh, out of, uh, well, it might have been out of Hartford, but I'm not sure now. I'll have to go back and dig that up. But there were, were people there that could explain to me what's going on with the ionosphere and propagation and how radio waves travel. And I was so in love with that, that when, the, when I first got onto the internet and the World Wide Web, I tried to search through the limited search features that were on the Internet at the time. I, I'm an early adopter, so I was on the Internet as soon as it was a thing. There were no websites that talked about this stuff. And I, it, it clicked in my mind that it's time for me to give back to the amateur radio community and to the shortwave listening community the wealth of information that I've gained over the years and how can I give that back but through a website of my own? Make a website, and I put the first amateur slant shortwave listening propagation website on the Internet. So I'm the first, and I can prove that <laughs> because some people have challenged me on that. I'm definitively the first amateur non-government outlet for space weather and radio propagation, and that was hfradio.org. I've got a second domain, sunspotwatch.com because that was better uh, as a name for that segment of my website at the time. It sorely needs overhaul at the moment, but I just don't have the time to do that. I'm probably going to hire somebody to help redesign the website. But long story short, um, when I got a web page and I began uh, posting forecasts and data, um, I began to have a following. Unbeknownst to me, Gibbs, the original CQ Amateur Radio Magazine's propagation uh, contributing editor came across that website and began researching me a little bit. When he retired from being the editor of that column, said to Rich in, at CQ Magazine that uh, I was one of the candidates that he would suggest replace him as writer of that column. So out of the blue, I get this email from Rich Moseson, and he said, hey, do you have time for a phone call? I have a proposal for you. And I thought, okay, sure, give me a call. And he introduced what CQ Magazine. I wasn't a 
a subscriber at the time of CQ. I only had the QST. And he described the magazine. He described the column. He said that George Jacobs is retiring and uh, suggested me as his successor. I was thrilled. I thought, wow, I've gone from giving back through a website to the potential of actually writing about this and educating amateur radio operators the stuff that I've learned throughout my life. What a what a great opportunity. And so for the first three editions, I co-wrote with George. More and more took over the column. Rich was happy with my writing. George was happy. George retired. Did it for 50 years, if I'm not mistaken. And he never missed an issue, not once. And it's like, what, 2001 or something like that? And I have missed a couple of editions, surgery, and I missed a couple of columns. But um, I, I just am still to this day thrilled that I have some opportunity to give back to the amateur radio and shortwave listening community because they gave me, in my opinion, so much in the beginning, so much Elmering insight to amateur radio. I had two different people give me rigs to inspire me to stay on the air or to get on the air and operate. And that was love for the hobby, an act of love for the communication uh, community to give me radios like that. You know, I was young. I didn't have the, the ability to afford those things. And I just feel giving back to the – this is my my calling, to give back to the community. So you're paying it forward, in other words. Paying it forward, yep. Right. Now, you mentioned your two – websites, hfradio.org and sunspotwatch.com. Are there other resources available on the internet to help a ham better understand what the happenings are in the universe and how it affects band openings and closings? Yeah, this, after about 2005 onward, I would say there was an explosion of different online resources coming in into the, the sphere of radio and propagation and space weather. You've got the governmental agencies, uh, the ESA, uh, the IPS out of Australia, of course, the, the NASA and the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center. You know, these are, are greatly funded now and information. Most government agencies have a repository of official data and some science on Radio Australia, but the IPS uh, in Australia, they've got some educational material, of course, read every page. There's the wiki, and there's been a lot of community efforts to enhance through the Wikipedia pages. Of course, a lot of my competitors that are out there uh, doing their take on space weather and the science of radio propagation. There's also YouTube is out there competing for, for your time. So, man, it's just amount of available information. The thing that bothers me and and really gets under my skin is that there's a lot of misinformation out there still, perpetuated from one source that sounds credible, and that's their source. They don't go and research to see if it's true. And there's a lot of myths still being perpetuated in the amateur radio community or the community at large, just the public, about things space weather related. For instance... You'll hear on the nightly news or you'll hear some amateur on an 80-meter round table or 75-meter round table uh, gathering in the evening. You'll hear this phrase, oh, the sun has erupted with a solar flare that will hit us in a couple of days and probably will make HF unusable. Well, okay, let's dissect that for a moment. A solar flare is an instantaneous explosion of up energy stored in the magnetic structures of the sun. When this burst of energy is released, instantaneous emission throughout the radio and light spectrum. Well, it takes eight, approximately eight minutes for light to go from the sun to the earth. So by the time we detect that a solar flare has occurred, we have already seen eight minutes go by in our time. We have some spacecraft that are in between the sun and the earth. So it may be that, you know, five minutes out or, or you know, seven minutes out, that satellite already detected it. But it minutes is a short period of time. Here's somebody in the evening on 80 meters saying a solar flare has occurred and it's going to hit us in three days. Well, they're not factual in, in that estimation. It's already occurred. That light's already hit the earth. The effect of that, that solar flare 
has already impacted the ionosphere within that eight-minute window. But what they're referring to is artifacts that are related to the solar flare, but not always to a solar flare. And that's the emission of plasma and plasma clouds that take a lot longer to get to the Earth. And it could take up to three days for that plasma cloud to ride the, the solar wind and then interact with the magnetosphere and affect our local terrestrial environment. That may come up to three days later. So kind of gray when people talk about space weather. So I have a mission in my columns, my website, my YouTube videos to try to explain how the science really works. And the reason that's important for a DX or to get on the radio and just start hunting. That's fun. It's like taking your fishing pole, taking your tackle, taking different kinds of bait, going down to the local watering hole, casting a line and hoping that you get a bite and spending a few hours there dangling your feet in the water. That's fun. It's relaxing. It's great. But if you have a limited window of time and you've got to feed your family and you want to go out and catch some fish, you might want to think about how can I best utilize my time? When's the best time to go get that fish? Where's that fish actually hanging out? What bait is really, you know, there's a, a bit of skill there and a bit of science. And people plan for their fishing trip. And then they go out, and if they're successful, they put food on the table. It's kind of the same thing in radio. Dishing, for instance, there's a lot of planning that goes in as to when they will operate on what band, which antenna, what direction. There's all that science. How they'll be successful as a de-expedition and maximize the opportunity for the extras around the world to make contact with that de-expedition. So if they understand space weather and understand what forecasting is telling them will happen, what time of year and the statistical variances of the ionosphere, they'll be better and equipped with navigating target areas and, and operations. So that's where I come in. That's why I'm still passionate about this. I'm trying to help people understand these things. Well, we're at the bottom of the uh, solar cycle, and the bands are supposed to be dead for the most part. Uh, are they dead for the most part? We discovered during the last solar minimum, which was an extended one, such an extended long, low period, years, like four, five years of marginal, if any, sunspot activity, I mean, we went months without one single sunspot. Um, everybody thought going into that that, yeah, the bands are going to be dead. It's not going to be possible to really enjoy HF. Start, you know, learning how to use a repeater. Start learning the VHF side of things because, man, you'll never get anything on HF. Well, that was proven wrong. First, anything below 20 meters can have good propagation with or without sunspots, especially when you get down to about 7 megahertz or below, you'll always have propagation even if there's no solar activity energizing ionosphere. It's just the science of the chemistry in the atmosphere and that there's going to be a strong enough ionosphere that up to 7 megahertz is going to propagate even if the ionosphere is um, just in a uh, low energy mode or, or condition. So we're talking 40 meters, 60 meters, 80 meters, 160 meters. I mean, so... Exactly. Yeah. Things that people consider as a nighttime ban. Right. Well, those will always work because there's no sun involved in nighttime propagation, really. I mean, there's a little bit of residual effect, but there's no direct sunlight. So whatever we experience on those bands, that's going to be always there no matter what part of the sunspot cycle we're in. But the ionosphere is this tricky thing. Even though we know sunspot activity correlates with ionospheric uh, density and layer uh, thickness, etc., there's also... The, the terrestrial science of the ionosphere. And we're talking about temperature inversions. We're talking about thunderstorms, uh, different phenomena that can stir up the ionosphere and change its dynamics. The ionosphere, for instance, is not just a flat like mirror surface. It's more like a bunched up silk cloth. It's very textualized. And so you'll have, even during sunspot minimum, we had 10-meter openings that weren't sporadic E, but were other types of modes that were uh, enhanced by maybe aurora or other types of things, and there's propagation possible. I've always told people, even though there's a science of propagation, it's still fun to go dangle your feet in the water, cast your line, and see if you get something. 
get on a band, even if you don't hear anything, and try a few calls. I mean, be you know, stay there at least ten minutes calling CQ because somebody else may be tuning across, going, "Huh, I wonder if the band's open today," and they'll be tuning across and they'll hear you. If everybody's listening, you'll never know there's an opening. You gotta actually get a signal out there, cast a line, and discover that maybe there's an opening. Whisper mode, WSPR by Joe Taylor, is one of those modes where you can have transmissions going on a band to ferret out how the propagation's uh, turning out on a band during a given. There are other modes now that are very active, but Whisper was a revolutionary thing. A PSK net was another effort, especially on 10 meters, for people to understand the openings that go on. And PSK net revealed a lot of what's capable on 10 meters during a solar minimum. So they were instrumental in, in gathering data. The sporadic E that's prevalent in the summer in North America is a fine example of how 10 meters can still be very active during a sunspot minimum, yet still give you lots of opportunity on 10 meters. 10 meters being at the very top of the radio spectrum, you have to have sunspot activity, a lot of sunspot activity for that band to even op be open or be operable. But it's not the case. Sporadic E, some aurora effects, um, transactorial propagation, different modes are all possible on 10 meters in those higher bands. So, yeah, it's radio is red hot, they said back in the 70s and 80s. I'm wondering whether or not the reason that people are having so much success with the digital modes well, not only because the digital nodes are, are clever and they can recover a signal, you know, way down in the noise, but they're kind of beaconing, right? They're they're sending CQ when for the digital modes, people would say, oh, the band's dead. They were all listening, but they weren't sending CQ. So I'm, right, right, exactly. I'm just wondering whether or not actually the people that are having great success with the digital modes are having that success because they're actually transmitting. Yep. Same thing happens during a contest. People discover that bands are alive during contests, but they're not, not alive when there's no contest? Well, how can that be? What, what, is it because all these signals warm the ionosphere? No. It's just because they're actually on the band operating and throwing out that signal that can be heard by somebody. You have a link on your uh, website to the current Aurora Oval. What is an Aurora Oval, and how and where does it affect propagation? The Earth is an amazing planet. And we've discovered that other planets are very much like Earth, in that the Earth, kind of like a bar magnet, you've got a North Pole and you've got a South Pole. And if you remember from grade school or perhaps junior high in America here, the science teacher that would have the iron fillings on a piece of paper, and underneath the paper or a cardboard box, they would take a bar magnet, and they would write underneath those metal filings. And lo and behold, we see magnetic lines emanating from each pole kind of like a donut, and the Earth has the same magnetic environment. Well, the solar wind, which always emanates from the sun in what's called a Parker spiral, if you've seen a sprinkler in a yard that goes around and around with like three or four arms spraying out these constant streams of water, as it's going around, those streams of water are curved. Well, the solar wind is this curved plasma and magnetic field line flow of energy out of the sun. And that interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. When the magnetic fields that ride the solar wind interact with the magnetic fields of the Earth, sometimes there's a connection. Like think of the two bar magnets where you have north and when you go as both so that one north is pointing to the south of the other, they connect. If you go north to north, they repeal like charges repealed, they say. So the Earth and the Sun kind of have this interaction through the solar wind of these magnetic interplays. If the solar wind is oriented in such a way that it connects with the Earth's magnetic field, it's like opening a window. The plasma, the space plasma coming out of the Sun, solar wind, goes through that connection into the Earth's magnetic field, it continues to ride the Earth's magnetic field, which, as you know, comes down at the poles. So all this plasma is raining down these magnetic lines and coming closer and closer to the Earth. Well, the aurora is a reaction or an interplay between the molecules and the plasma. 
the plasma comes in, bombards these molecules, and forces electrons out of orbit, emitting light. So the aurora is this beautiful display of how our atmosphere interplays with solar plasma. A shield, it protects us. This magnetic field actually is a force field that protects us. The ionosphere formed by the chemistry and magnetic interplay of those molecules and electrons in, in our atmosphere form this shield that protects us both from the extreme ultraviolet as well as that plasma. And the aurora is like this, kind of like a rainbow in a different way, a testimony of this protection that we have around us. Beautiful. Not only is it visually beautiful, but the concept that we can live on this planet so close to the sun, protected by this force field around us, that's a beautiful display of our existence. Something to celebrate. You have a love for CW. Do you consider it a digital mode? And how's it doing now? <laughs> yes. Morse code is digital. It's on and off. And there will be purists who will say, well, it's not a computer type of digital. It's not binary. Yeah, I know. Maybe call it a gray area. I turned it digital mode. It's the only digital mode that you don't need a computer for. It's your own brain, your own computer. Morse code is my first in ham radio. So it's my first love. I still feel that Morse code as a language and a mode on HF, the odds, you can work so much more DX than you can with a single sideband emission. And the reason for that is the efficiency of that carrier wave just being broken as opposed to the envelope of a single sideband emission. You G out of the same wattage of a signal when you're, when you're using Morse code. Your brain is also an incredible computer. It has the ability to filter and uh, do the conversion into intelligence way more than any computer or analog circuit can do. So I guess that's probably what inspires me the most about Morse code is just pure human ability to decode not spoken and link yourself all over the world through such a primitive method of communication it defies time. And of course, it's musical, it's rhythm. You know, every operator has their own style of sending Morse code. So you can, over time, learn how to discern who's who, the, the Morse code signature. Unlike a computer-generated signal that is hard and fast defined, it's, it's very uh, precise. Morse code doesn't have to be precise. A dialect, you can have an accent, as it were, in Morse code. So it's very personal, very intimate in that way, very human. It's the quote-unquote cold digital world of computer-generated things. Well, that's and, a pretty good. Yeah, that's a pretty good description. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? I really am inspired by two. It's the maker movement, and one is the movement. I'm sorry, what was the second one? Per those that are preparing for disaster, the end of the world. Oh, the prepper movement. Prepper movement. Right. Both of those have given a boost to electronics and amateur radio communications. That Both of those movements have captured the younger minds, and that's exciting. For amateur radio to survive, you need the young and the new blood coming in with fresh ideas, curiosity, and the passion to explore the boundaries of what's possible. One of the things amateur radio has always been is a seed base or an incubator for new ideas in communication. A lot of innovation in our commercial products and commercial offerings, amateur radio, and in the bright minds, took a concept, put it to the test, proved it out, viable idea through the amateur radio service, and then it made its way into commercial radio, etc. So the young mind getting inspired by the possibilities in science and experimentation results. Somebody can hang their hat on some all QSL cards, even though there's a lot of electronic QSL cards, there's still some paper QSL cards. There's different forms of reward. And these young minds successful in trying out a new idea and getting some kind of a reward for it, it, it just inspires this new and fresh outlook. And that's inspiring to me. 
um, school clubs, early 2000s. Nothing like seeing the joy somebody who's really shy gets onto a microphone, but all of a sudden has a conversation with somebody thousands of miles away, and there was this human connection through a microphone, a box, and some wire. No internet, no cell phone, magic. And this, just that inspires the young mind. But there's so much more. Um, building robots, which isn't quite ham radio. And building radio kits, equipment, having all of that rich, involved, hands-on involvement inspires the young. And that's what's so amazing to me. What advice would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? Well, you caught a great aspect of wisdom early on in this conversation, and that is listen. So the first bit of advice to radio is get yourself a radio that's capable of listening to local repeaters or get a shortwave kind and begin antennas and listening. Listen to everything you can, amateur. Hear what is probably not good operation and identify what that is. Form your own opinions about it. Learn what works. Hear the culture. Try to absorb the culture of amateur radio. Read as much as you can about the ethics of operation, operation, or the technical side of operation. And absorb as much as you can in the beginning. But also be bold, skin, as in any large group of people. You're always going to have the bad actors. And amateur radio has bad actors. Skin and let it just be water off your back. Don't let them dissuade you. Don't let them inspire bad feelings about the community and about amateur radio because those few bad actors are not representative of the vast majority of people that are in the amateur radio community. So have a thick skin and be bold and venture out eventually in actual operation on the air. Maybe you'll start with digital operations because that might be less scary. You don't have to talk. You just have to type on a keyboard or maybe not even type on a keyboard, some modes, you just click some buttons. And that'll be your first foray. Or maybe you'll venture into Morse code and you'll actually try. I'll tell you, after they dropped the Morse code requirement, Morse code operation actually increased. And it's provable because some of the CW contests had more participants active in the contest submitting logs after the dropping of CW as a requirement than before. So it's proven that people love to sail sailboats even though they can use a motorboat. Yeah, I think that's a great point. There are opportunities on amateur radio for you to get out, be bold, enter in for you, and enjoy yourself. And it's a hobby. Remember that, too. It's a hobby. It is a life for some people. It's a lifestyle for many people. But it is still a hobby. And so you got to have a bit of humor. You've got to have an attitude that, hey, opinions and I have mine, but we could all play along in this huge space known as amateur radio. It's a very wide and broad hobby, little nicks and in corners of interest, special interest groups on building uh, low wattage, what we call QRP, low power transceiver, or people that love to build amplifiers and, and discover new ways to put out as much power as possible. You know, there's, there's something for everyone. You'll find your niche. You'll find your rhythm. That's certainly true. I want to thank you for coming on the QSO Today podcast. It's been inspiring. So uh, with that, I want to thank you and wish you 73. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, Eric. It's been enjoyable. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Thomas. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in NW7US in the search box at the top of the page. If you'd like to sponsor the transcription of this episode or any of the previous QSO Today episodes into written text, the cost is $67. US There is a button on the right side of the show notes page to start this process. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. 
Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages. Finally, let Amazon pay us at no charge to you by using our Amazon link on the show notes page before you enter Amazon to do your shopping. Amazon gives us a small percentage of everything that you buy. Your privacy is assured as we do not see who is purchasing and what is being purchased. By supporting the QSO Today podcast, you offset my out-of-pocket expenses to record, produce, and host now over 184 episodes of QSO Today. I am extremely grateful for your support. QSO Today is available in the iTunes Store and now a host of podcast services and applications. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.